I guess one of the things I took away from the conference, and it was Zafiris' presentation at the beginning when he talked about what you measure uh, as being important, because the title of this session is Closing the Gap, is um, the fear of falling in the trap of uh, choosing benchmarks that we know we can easily um, reach and then declare victory. Um, this is, this is a very common uh, thing that economists do. If we can't solve the problem we're interested in, we get interested in the problem we can solve. And so we also, when we want to show success, we pick the numbers that we know we can somehow doctor or force by legislation or, or any other means. Um, and I, I, I came to the conference, I'm not an expert in this field at all, which gives me the great advantage of being a consumer and, and seeing what it is that I've learned and what questions remain in my mind. So I'll give a couple of examples of dilemmas that I don't think were resolved in my mind listening to the research that was presented. I think of closing the gap as a gap of um, uh, um, freedom of choice, freedom of opportunities, um, um, protection from abuse of various types, uh, not necessarily focusing on a gap as in uh, the number of men who are in the workforce versus the number of women, etc., which could be voluntary. I'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, so so that, that, I guess, I'll jump straight to my first dilemma. Um, some of the speakers, um, in particular Hadi in the conference, but we also had a workshop the day before the conference and the issue came up, um, culture being uh, a player. Um, and we know that MENA is very different from the rest of the world, uh, especially in gender-related cultures in terms of um, household, intra-household politics, as well as um, labor market participation, uh, higher education, and so on. And we know that um, causation runs in both directions. Economics can affect norms. So it's quite possible that in MENA we see both men and women disproportionately agreeing that if jobs are scarce, then the men should have priority, is a byproduct of the fact that you have very high unemployment, and maybe if you didn't have such a high unemployment, the norms themselves would have been different. Um, but it doesn't necessarily follow that any economic intervention will solve that problem. We know also that norms can affect uh, the economy and can keep people who are more talented out of the workforce and therefore lead to lower GDP growth, which leads to more unemployment so we could have a feedback mechanism. But how do we break that cycle? Um, I find myself still, after having listened to all the presentations, um, presented with a bad choice between two different types of paternalism. And I use that term uh, on purpose. Um, one of them is the paternalism of saying, well, we have to respect norms. We have to respect choices. That's what they want to do. Who are we to tell them that they should uh, feel differently and so on? But then there are problems with um, hysteresis. You know, where did these uh, norms emerge from in the first place? As well as cognitive dissonance. If this is what we have, then we have to justify it both as men and as women. Um, but it's still paternalism to go anywhere and say you should have preferences different from the preferences that you have. Um, the alternative um, paternalism, of course, is um, the cultural condescendence of saying we as Westerners know better and we should mold you after our image, um, which we know in many cases backfires. And it, it's quite possible that um, the rise of um, the reactionary religious um, currents that were discussed in the last panel was indeed a reaction to um, a careless modernization uh, attempt in the 19th and early 20th century uh, that didn't uh, take all of society uh, with it. So we are torn between these two uh, paternalisms. Let me give you the dilemma at, at a very, very micro level that I know really well in academia. Um, so it's very common in US academia at least that um, uh, if a woman decides to have a child, then we suspend her 10-year clock for a year. Um, she can take up to a year of, uh, for childcare. Well, then um, she's disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis her male colleagues because 
she has to wait an extra year. The alternative, and this is something I, I argued with my colleagues about, is to say, well, why can't we just do a per year evaluation of the output? So if, you know, after seven years, she had a year of leave, so, you know, we require just to compare the output per year. Um, but then you run into the problem of saying, well, so are you setting different standards now for men and women? And what does that say about the women who got tenure? So your choices are either to have her wait an extra year or carry the stigma of being evaluated at a lower level. And then you raise all sorts of problems with saying, well, if you have lower output standards, then how can you argue for equal work, for equal pay, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I worry about um, pressure. So if, if, if one of my colleagues decides she, she wants to be there with her infant child for that year, and we're not going to accommodate it in this way, and some others say, well, we have daycare in our university. She has no excuse. She could have you know, come in and kept the child in daycare, and, and um, isn't that infringing on her personal choice? So we're facing a dilemma where whatever we do, we're not being equitable. Um, so, um, I think um, that was what was behind the question I asked in the very first session to Professor Floro. Um, and um, and I, I, maybe you misunderstood the question, but I, I said it's a fact that many women in this region in particular are in the workforce, having very successful careers. They decide for cultural uh, reasons or any others to leave the workforce. It, it, whether we should have changed their preferences beforehand, or the, the fact is they decided on that. And how do we translate whatever human capital they accumulated? Now, my, my former boss, uh, Dr. Lisa Anderson, the president of ASC, is to say, well, of course motherhood is very useful because all being an academic leader is about is teaching people how to tie their shoes. And <laughs> I did that with my small children, I can do it with faculty. There's a lot of truth in that. but. But in many areas, it's, it's not easy to translate. And I don't know that we have the policies to bridge that gap. And I suggested that it, it, it's not only the, the lost human capital because of years of work that were lost, but also the loss of the social network uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, professional work. And even in academia, it's very difficult to come back and start getting grants after you've, you've gone through a, a, a quiet period. So these, these are the questions I came into because I'm not in this development realm. And I think I left without good answers because I don't think we've dissected the, the causal relationships between economics uh, and, and culture and then understand how policy can influence both. So uh, that's where I am. <laughs>